This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Hiroja Shy. This is Hiroja Shy once again with another episode of Musings of the Shy podcast. This episode is episode 145. All those poor elves. I haven't set free yet. I'm going to stay over during Christmas because there aren't enough hats. This is about user activated software BIP 148. We're going to cover this particular, um, not only BIP, but methodology of getting segment activated. The date, if you will, of this activation is supposed to occur August 1st. So we're going to go over a little bit of the history and the whys and why that's about that. But before we get into all of that about user activated software, the news. So the news is going to be very short. I just, uh, this has kind of been happening a lot lately. Uh, these different kind of, I want to say hacks, but leakages that are occurring with the government. A lot of them has to do with Amazon's um, cloud service platform, where there's these uh, these intelligent companies, these private contractors, are keeping their information on Amazon, and it's not properly secure, and it gets leaked. So here we go. NYU accidentally exposed military code breaking computer project to the entire internet uh, by Sam Bill. In early December 2016, Adam was doing what he was doing somewhere between hobby and profession. Looking for things that are on the internet shouldn't be. This week he came across a server inside the New York University's famed Institute for Mathematics and Advanced Computing, computing headed by the brilliant uh, Chalusky brothers, David and Greg Green. The server appeared to be an internet connected backup drive. By saving filled with family photos of spreadsheet, this drive held confidential information on an advanced code breaking machine that had never been, de- been described in public. Dozens of documents scanning hundreds of pages detailed the project. A joint supercomputing initiative administered by the NYU, the Department of Defense, and IBM and they were available for the entire world to download. The supercomputer described in the trove when Sir Green was a system designed to excel at the sort of complex mathematics that underlies the fiction. The technology that keeps data private almost certainly intended to be used by the Defense Department signals and intelligence unit. The National Security Agency, Blue uh, Green was an accessory to another password cracking machine used by NSA, Blue Blue, which also de- documented the material leak for the NYU, which had been previously described in the Norwegian press thanks to a document provided by the National Security Agency, Whistleblower, and Rich Snowden. Both systems were intended to be used by the Pentagon and a select few other Western governments, including Cambridge and Norway. Adam, an American digital security researcher, requested that his real name not be published out of fear of losing his day job. Although he deals with tossing and doodle with carelessness, Adam was nonetheless stunned by what NYU had made available to the world. The fact that the software through specs, sheets, and all the manuals to go with it were sitting on, out in the open for anyone to copy is just simply mind blowing. He described to the interpreter how easy it would have been for someone to obtain the material, which was marked with the warnings like distributed distribution through the U.S. government agency's only request for this document to be referred to and approved by the DOD and IBM confidential at the time of discovery. Adam wrote to me in an email. All those leaky data is courtesy what I can assume are misconfigurations in the IMSS, or Institute of Mathematics and Advanced Supercomputing Department at NYD. Not even a single username or password separates these files from the public internet right now. It is absolutely safe. The files were taken down after Adam notified him why <coughs> Intelligence agencies like the NSA hide code breaking advances like this are doing because their disclosures might accelerate what has become a cryptographic arm race. Encrypted the information on the computer used to be a dark art shared between militaries and mathematicians, but advances in cryptography and rapidly swollen interest in privacy in the wake of Snowden have helped make encryption tech an effortless everyday commodity for consumers. Web connections are officially shielding using the HTTPS protocol, and then encryption has come popular popular chat platforms like WhatsApp, and secure phone calls can now be enabled simply by downloading some software to your device. Uh, the average person doing a checking account online or chatting on IE message might not realize the mathematical complexities involved to make it easier to be practical. The spread of encryption is a good thing unless you're one trying to eavesdrop. Spies like the NSA can sometimes thwart encryption by going out around it, find flaws in the way programmers build their apps, or take advantage of improperly configured devices. When that fails, they may try to use encryption keys to extraordinarily complex math or repeated guessing. This is where specialized systems like Windsor Green, through the NSA, and Edge, particularly when the agency targets aren't aware of how much code breaking computing power they are up against. Adam declined comment on the pursuits of any conversation he might have had with the Department of Defense or IBM. He had the NYU at the very least express his gratitude for him notifying it of the leak of my mailing of the poster. While he's trying to figure out what exactly the Windsor flights belong to and just how they wound up on completely naked floor on the internet, Adam called David Shadowski, the well-known uh, mathematician and IMSA coordinator at NYU. Richard Shadowski was a cinch because his entire email outbox, including correspondence with active members of the U.S. military, for some reason stored on the NYU drive and made publicly available alongside the Windsor documents. According to Adam, Shadowski confirmed the knowledge of the university's involvement in the supercomputer project. The 
is Shepard was unable to reach the Massimo directly from this. The school's association is also strongly indicated by the fact that Davis' brother, Gregory himself, an internet mathematician and professor at NYU, is listed as an author of a 164 page document from the cash described the people. There is no indication of the responsibility for the leak. Indeed, the identity of the person to person responsible for putting a box full of military secrets on the public internet remains utterly unclear. And they might use spokespersons would not comment on the university's relationship with the Department of Defense, IBM, or the Wizard Program in general. When the interpreter initially asked what was her the spokesperson seemed unfamiliar with the project, saying they were unable to find anything that meets her description. The same spokesperson personally later added that no NYU or NYU patent system was breached, referring to the Camden School of Engineering, which houses the IMAS. The statement is somewhat of a non secretor says, according to Adam, the files leaked simply by being exposed to the open internet. None of the material was protected by username, password, or firewall, or any kind of system, so no breach would have been necessary. You, get, kick, you can hit, can't kick down a wide open door. And then the article kind of continues. Uh, this is very, very interesting. Uh, I'll rank it up because one of the biggest concerns when it comes to encryption is the breaking of SHA-256 and the ramping up of quadratic computers, how they might uh, break all sense or known cryptography and making things like Bitcoin uh, useless. So that's it for the news. On to the user-activated software for Bitcoin 48. So user activated software, which is using BIP 148 to enact this software. And what it tells is that nodes, not the miners, will run BIP 148 within the node program. And they will basically reject any block that doesn't signal for SegWit. So whether it be the 148 or the 141 already out there. And will continue to do so until uh, more and more miners join the this new chain that is SegWit activated and it gets locked in and we have SegWit. That's pretty much sums up what this uh, user activated software is. Well, we're going to go into more details about it, but I just want to give a kind of a base summary. It has to deal with BIP 148 and trying to get SegWit and also acknowledging BIP 141. So this is from the BIP 148 organization and we'll also talk about um, another one called August 1st, but we can start here first. So Zong's workshop. BIP 148 mandatory activation and SegWit deployment. Uh, user activated software allows the economic majority of users to specify new behaviors that the miners must then enforce. You may wish to read the formal specification for BIP 148 and hear for more context on why many are planning to enforce the activation of SegWit. So, the road to SegWit data witness. Uh, Living in a dark and dreary world lay past the relics of P2KH 160 bit hash, no scripting version and translation not transaction malleability. We must clear the mind of the past. Bitcoin's enlightenment has been achieved thanks to tireless efforts of the Bitcoin developers. The people of this workshop invite you to relax and meditate on the important lessons of the masters we began to see with clarity and learn to use the time honor techniques in a new and integrated fashion and then carefully consider using a Bitcoin client that participates that implements the Bit 148 standard. The Bitcoin network has held hostage by, by those who are paid to protect it. This workshop builds a tool for regular users to reestablish the ability the actual ability to decide how the Bitcoin network should be run. The user activated software, or USF, allows users to coordinate and collectively force the miners in adopting new roles. The BIP 148 works by making your Bitcoin client ignore any blocks that doesn't signal for SegWit between midnight August 1st of 2017 and midnight November 15th, 2017. This will enable the natural activation of SegWit as specified by the BIP 9 protocol, so 95% hashing approval. Participants, upon meditation, they decide to join us in our quiet our quest to activate segregated witness on the Bitcoin network. In the process, uh, asserting that the Bitcoin users hold a natural and rightful ownership over the network. We suggest you research about SegWit and learn how user activate uh, USF works. Once you feel that you have a basic understanding, please consider to download any and run versions of Bitcoin software that implement the, the BIP 148 protocol. You can help the Bitcoin sellers and also important to take part in the community. However, be very strategic with your time and energy. The forums are full of AI, pay trolls, and vote manipulation. If you're a developer, please consider to help with the development of the Bitcoin, but possibly even encouraging and helping other Bitcoin projects adopt BIP 148. So benefits. Why participate? For recognition, inspiration, and amazing hope that we will refer to showing people how amazing Bitcoin really is. The site serves as an equal part inspiration for those fighting for, the, for freedom. It cer certainly isn't a tool to troll anyone in particular. It's something that humanity's future generations can look back on. 
and it, you direct, it directs you to download a BIF-148. It has information how to download and verify the BIF-148 binaries. It has a PG key to verify security downloads. Unstable bit build previews for developers. Um, and the last time, please remember to always check binary checksums with most trusted people before using and check back here for updates. It has the SHA-256 and SHA-5112 uh, keys here. So this is a location of where you can download for your node if you choose to BIF-148. And mind you, the signaling date is August 1st. This is why Segwit2x is rushing its code and hurrying on up to signal July 27th to get their version of the protocol activated. <clears throat> so this is from Bitcoin Magazine by Kyle, Kyle Torpey, May 11, 2016. Bitcoin reaches a consensus with scaling debate and not a crisis. Uh, judging from the various reports in the media over the past year, Bitcoin is in a serious crisis that threatens its very existence. The long-time Bitcoin developer Mike Kern even left the ecosystem entirely and came to claim that the project is now a failed experiment. Of course, Bitcoin has been claimed dead roughly 100 other times. Scalability is the main concern in Bitcoin right now, but some, including blockchain capital managing director Brock Pierce, have argued that this is more of a sign of success than anything. The fact that the system needs to scale in order to welcome new users is a sign that people find this technology useful for a variety of use cases. While it's important not to become complacent, a longtime cypherpunk, Zuka, Zuka Will, Wilcox O'Hare, recently warned, Rock Streams' John Dealey said that recently that much of the distress and panic coming from certain segments of the community is unwarranted. During an interview on the Crypto Show, Dilly said the progress and scalability is being made by the Bitcoin Core developers, and the development gridlock is not a big an issue as some would think. Uh, Zika also is uh, one responsible for Zcash. What's the worst that can happen? One of the main reasons there's a belief that Bitcoin is reaching a crisis point it has to do with the blocks filling up near capacity at times. As blocks fill with the transaction, a bid and war ensures for the right to get one transaction into a block and confirm in a timely manner. In response to this potential issue, Dilly told the crypto show, the absolute worst thing that can happen to Bitcoin right now is a classic analogy. Nobody goes to that restaurant anymore. It's always full. This point radiates Pierce's recent statement on how Bitcoin scalability issues is a sign of success. In his remark, Dilly was echoing comments made by BitTorrent creator Bram Conan in June 2015. To get a second opinion on the Bitcoin's possible, possible crisis point, Bitcoin Magazine reached out to the Digital Currency Council Director of Curriculum and Content, Dan uh, McAdro, who believes that on-chain transactions should be kept as cheap as possible for as long as possible, be it increasing the Bitcoin's block size limit and other means. In regard to Dillard's or my, rightly Kona's restaurant analogy, uh, McAdro responded, well, that's one restaurant may be crowded, but but by now expanding quickly when there's ample demand is inviting competitors to eat his lunch. Um, McAdro added that Bitcoin has, has had no competition in the blockchain-based electronic cash market up to this point. But it fears that the door to more competition is open. As Bitcoin is hot water for settlement, as Bitcoin Classic developer Gavin Andreessen and Jeff Garza can refer to it, the Bitcoin Core's development roadmap of capacity, capacity increases. Scaling progress continues to be made. While figuring out how to allow more people to use Bitcoin is indeed an, an issue, Bill says the, world, the work is being done to help solve this problem. To be clear, the slow method did not comp compromise the technical sound progress continues to be made, he said. Things that are in the Bitcoin's best interest continue to get done. So, we have things that are filling up, we know this. Um, we have had the rise of other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, Litecoin, Dash, Monero, and Zcash have been rising in usage. And particularly Litecoin and Ethereum have uh, really chipped into Bitcoin supremacy. The recent release of Bitcoin Core 0.1.12 is perhaps the strongest evidence to back up Dylan's claims. The release includes a soft fork for a check sequence verify, which allows for the relatively lock times is, is usually important in the development of Lightning Network, which Blockstream CTO and Bitcoin Core contributor Jer Gregory Maxwell views as Bitcoin's best chance to handle an increased demand for Bitcoin transactions. Block co-founder Jeff Garza disagrees and views size chains as a better option. Uh, Bitcoin Core 12 is also the first time the group of contributors behind the project use BIP9 version bits to deploy its software. This method of deployment allows multiple softworks to be rolled out simultaneously, which means improvements can be implemented more quickly. So this is why you can have BIP141, which has this signal, it's in the Bitcoin core, and still have uh, <clears throat> BIP148 being activated by users through the node. Or even in the case of Segwit2x, even though they're not using the BIP protocol and using a totally different uh, core implementation, if you will, can occur. Uh, Bitcoin threatened by political gridlock. Some members of the Bitcoin ecosystem, as Bitcoin Foundation chief scientist Gavin Andreessen worry, with the difficulties associated with making changes to the Bitcoin consensus rules, 
are slowing down the development process. But others, such as Bitcoin core contributor Corey Fields, who is Andrew Neese and colleague at the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, feel that the, the ability to implement controversial changes is a sign of strength in terms of Bitcoin's level of decentralization. During his interview on the crypto show, Dewey compared gridlock to Bitcoin development to gridlock in Congress. The difference between political gridlock in Congress and political gridlock at Bitcoin Core is one, one doesn't tax your ass, and two, Bitcoin keeps working. Uh, Dylan's point was that Bitcoin would keep working in a scenario where complete gridlock happened and no further changes were possible. If every person who could develop on Bitcoin died today and we assume that there are no security flaws that are going to rise tomorrow that need rapid action, it will keep working. And then it kind of goes on. So avoiding a startup X development process. One last point made by Dill on the crypto show was that Bitcoin does not use a sort of fast-paced development process that's often found in startups in Silicon Valley. I uh, didn't know why, in his viewpoint, this approach was not taken by the Bitcoin core contributors. We're talking about a $6.5 billion of value, and we're talking about the first attempt for a truly sovereign money. To take an approach where it just goes as fast as you can until it breaks is not really something you want it to be in the place when it comes to Bitcoin. Dilla also knows the vast based approach may work with the development of a new photo sharing app, but things work differently when you're talking about people's money at it. If Bitcoin goes dark for six hours, the game is over, and crypto cryptocurrency gets set back 10 years. A crossroad rather than a crisis. Although some say Bitcoin currency is in a crisis, Mick um, Adder defines the current situation as a crossroad. He, he told Bitcoin Magazine, there are competing visions on how to upgrade the system and they have different long-term trade-offs. But on a technical level, either, either will work and one or both will soon be implemented. So I don't think it's fair to say there's a full-blown crisis. In terms of preference for the Bitcoin's future direction, Mick Adder added, throwing in the towel on the main chain scaling now in favor of settlement layer, approach due to the realization that block, the block size can't scale forever is a little bit like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. McAdle believes that Bitcoin should scale via on-chain and layer two solutions. It doesn't have to be one or the other, and the main chain fees don't have to rise soon, even with significantly increased usage. As far as declarations of the Bitcoin experience owner, uh, McAdle finds such claims to be vastly premature and much or less absurd, although he's concerned that many in the Bitcoin ecosystem are willing to accept higher on-chain fees ignore the competitive landscape and opt for more complex solutions, at least in his view. And he added that none of this means Bitcoin is failing by any means. And McAdle shows his final thoughts on Bitcoin's crossroad moment. When I first started researching Bitcoin in 2011, I realized it had the potential to be the best form of money humanity has ever created. And that's still true today. After all, money in all forms, be it seashells or government-issued digits in the bank account, is just a societal ledger used to reduce the friction of exchange. Bitcoin is more inferitable, global, low friction lever ever found. We should make sure that however Bitcoin grows and all the properties. So continuing on. So here's another Bitcoin Magazine article. It's by Aaron Van Weirden, staff writer. Uh, this came out May 23rd, 2017. These two USFs could activate SegWit. Segregated witness, the Bitcoin protocol upgrade proposed by the Bitcoin Core development was originally de de designed to activate via the Bitcoin Improvement Protocol, MIP9. Okay, so we already know this. So the pseudonym driver who goes by the name of Shaolin Fry considers this an abusive coordination mechanism. He thoroughly recently proposed an alternate activation scheme, a user-activated soft fork, better known as UASF. Shaolin Fry also drafted two Pacific USF proposals, BIP-148 and BIP-149. Both of these are currently in the running for user adoption. And speaking with Bitcoin Magazine, Shaolin Fry at least seems sure that one of them will be adopted by the network. There is no universe in which SegWit will not activate. Segwit and the uh, USF. A soft fork is a change to the Bitcoin protocol that introduced new rules of tightening existing ones. This makes soft forks backward compatible. Those that do not upgrade should remain part of the same Bitcoin network. Segregated witness is a soft fork that would increase Bitcoin's block size limit and solve some long standing protocol issues. While it's always hard to say with conclusive to certainty, the proposal seems to be a broad support within the Bitcoin ecosystem. Many wallets and exchanges and other companies in the space have indicated that they're ready for it while an overwhelming share of re reachable nodes on the network have implemented the solution too. As per BIP9, the current implementation of SegWit activates if, if about 95% of the hash and power signal support within a two-week difficulty period before November. However, the hash power support has so far stagnated around 30%. This apparent mismatch between the ecosystem and hash power support is why some like BIP9 co-author Rusty Russell are increasingly thinking that activation method was a mistake, as Shaolin Fry does too. The main issue with BIP9 is that it has a veto of only about 5% of the hash power, shall we probably explain. That veto could be intentional or unintentional, triggering, triggered. Intentionally, like how miners are currently blocking segway activation, or unintentionally due to upgrade apathy. Miner activation also draws attention to the mining pool operators critically. The whole world is paying attention to who is and, and is it signaling. 
this is undesirable. And what if the soft work is, is for something that could make governments angry? We know this is the case in China for anonymity features increasing in the United States as well. As such, Shiloh and Propose activated Segway through a user activated software. The idea behind any AS, UASF, in short, is that users simply activate the software as agreed upon at a point in time. If the users represent a majority of the Bitcoin economy, exchanges, merchant users, miners are financially incentivized to follow the new software fork rules. If they don't, they can mine invalid blocks, and according to the majority of the Bitcoin economy, and the Bitcoins they earn will be worthless or worth nothing at all. Once the majority of hash power does follow these financial incentives and enforce the new rules, the rest of the Bitcoin ecosystem should automatically file, just like with any other soft fork. So BIP148, the first user activated proposal drafted by Shaolin is BIP148. But BIP148 is interesting to take on the USF, US, UASF because it actually designed to trigger the existing BIP9 SegWit activation threshold. If you want to redeploy SegWit, you must wait for a current deployment to expire by November this year, because many Bitcoin nodes won't accept it otherwise, Shaolin explained. BIP148 is, is a way to make the current BIP141 deployment active before November. The faster and has the advantage that more than 70% of the nodes have, has already upgraded. Specifically starting on August 1st, BIP148 nodes reject any Bitcoin blocks that do not signal support for segregated witness via BIP9. So the majority of the Bitcoin economy enforces BIP148. Miners will have to signal support of SegWit in order to have their blocks re not have their blocks rejected. Once the miners do signal support for SegWit, the signal would also trigger all the normal SegWit nodes on the network, and all those nodes would then enforce SegWit, even if they didn't participate in the BIP148 activation. So because BIP141 is already in the Bitcoin Core, and anyone running a current Bitcoin Core node already has BIP141 in it, um, as soon as SegWit is activated by the miners, then those nodes will trigger and there will be SegWit in nodes as well. So they don't actually have to upgrade. They don't even have to switch to BIP148 if they don't want to. Uh, they can stay as is and wait to see if the miners uh, signal for SegWit. So that was, that's what makes uh, BIP148 uh, backwards compatible, if you will. And for the game theory perspective, it may be viable for a relatively small minority of the Bitcoin ecosystem to get BIP148 active, activated. Miners should have little to lose by signaling support for SegWit, but something to lose for not signaling a small total number of users to sell their Bitcoins to. And such, even a modest but committed BIP148 user base could potentially be enough. Finally, echoing this medium post on Bitcoin's SegWit activation, Shaolin Fry noted that even the possibility of such a user-activated software could be enough to make minor signal support without even needing those to actually enforce it. So BIP148 risk and incentives. There are, however, some risks. These are why some prominent Bitcoin core developers like Boxstream, CTO Gregory Maxwell, and Chaincode Labs co-founder uh, Shahas uh, Dafpur consider BIP148 too disruptive. Curve 1, BIP148, otherwise valid blocks, would be rejected merely because they didn't include a signal. The rejections of these blocks would waste miners' resources and de detrimentally affect Bitcoin security. Moreover, if only a minority of hash and power enforces the new rules, either because they ignore the financial incentive or because only a small minority of the economy enforces the new rules in the first place, the Bitcoin blockchain can split in two. This would be, this, there, there could be a segwit chain, and a non-segway. That would open a new can of worms where the risk for users on both ends of the chain are not the same. And that's where you get the replay attacks and things of that nature. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the negatives of all these different proposals to the network. The incentives are clear there for miners to follow the economies of shallow and responsive criticism. But indeed, there's a chain split risk. If less than 51% of the miners comply and run BIP 148, However, even in this circumstance, the non-BIP 148 chain is asymmetrical disadvantage and will almost certainly be completely wiped out. The SegWit chain will always be more valuable, and once the majority of miners switch to that chain, the non-SegWit chain will disappear altogether. That is not in itself, it's not certain, as in the case uh, was demonstrated with Ethereum and ETC. Furthermore, for a certain threshold on, the risk of chain split becomes smaller as it gathers more support. That's why another prominent Bitcoin core developer, Luke Dash Jr., is throwing his weight behind the proposal. And to avoid these kind of risks, there could be another twist to BIP148 as well, Shaolin pointed out. The interesting thing about BIP148 is that any majority of miners can trigger it. It doesn't have to be 95%. If 75% or even just 51% of the hash and power starts rejecting non-signaling blocks per August 1st, they will always claim the longest chain. So really, all miners will from then on have to signal support and activate SegWit and have all their blocks orphaned by the network. Finally, Shaolin and Fry may also release code seg signal to allow miners to signal whether they will deploy BIP 148 and under what conditions. Using this, miners could, for example, 
agreed to activate SegWit through BIP 148 if only if 51% indicate they're willing to do. We should remove any risk of chain split in even a short lived one, Shao and Fry said. So really, it's a race to make sure there's not a chain split when it comes to SegWit 2X and user activated uh, soft fork uh, BIP 148. Shao's alternative uh, USF proposal BIP 149 BIP-149 utilizes an entirely new software activation mechanism, BIP-8. BIP-8 resembles BIP-9 in the initial allows miners to activate the software through hashing power. However, as opposed to BIP-9, the software proposal doesn't time out by the end of the activation period. Instead, it sets an activation deadline. If the deadline is reached, the nodes activate the software regardless of hashing power support. This is particular technical advantages of BIP-149 over BIP-148 is less intrusive for miners, or BIP-148 effectively forces miners to signal. With BIP 149, miners don't actually have to do all that much. They can support SegWit if they want to. If not, they may want to run so-called border node to filter invalid transactions and block post-activation, but that's about it. Shaolin Fry, Fry plans to implement BIP 149 in the dedicated Bitcoin software if BIP 148 doesn't succeed and when the current BIP 9 SegWit proposal has expired by mid-November. So if BIP 141 doesn't activate, if BIP 148 doesn't force the activation of BIP 149, and again, this is also contingent as, as SegWit 2x doesn't happen. Then uh, once, because you have to have a fallow period, once um, all that's cleared out of the system, because there's end dates, you can't just have a proposal hang out there forever. Uh, then the activation deadline for Bit49 is in schedule for early July 28, uh, July uh, 2018. Some developers like Maxwell are in no rush to activate SegWit and consider BIP-149 preferable, while others like Dash Shainer believe it will take too long. Shaolin herself noted that BIP-149 is not too slow from a technical point of view, but I do think that the longer SegWit is inactivated, the more gremlins and obstacles are going to besiege Bitcoin. So if the ecosystem rallies around BIP-148, that will bring this nightmare to a close. So here's a bit of a user's guide to the uh, activation of soft fork of uh, BIT148. Uh, this is written a while ago, but here we go. In a few months, and this comes from reuse coins, in a few months, uh, which is not months, it's actually weeks, begins August 1st, 2017, there may be some turbulence ahead for the Bitcoin network. Bitcoin core full nodes compromise more than 95% of the Bitcoin network are susceptible to a CVE 2017-1930 BIP. BIP148 upgrade nodes with fixed security vulnerability. Don't be scared though, since this the CSC bug and security vulnerability is talking about the malleability, transaction malleability, being intensively reviewed by the technical community. If you run and rely on the most recent version of the Bitcoin core, core full node, then you should be 99% safe, but for the 1% chance. The user at uh, the USF will result from the fork of the Bitcoin core and BIP 148 coins that will be list, listed by BitFinex. So it's talking about how there are already exchanges willing to sell uh, coins that are mined with SegWit. To be clear, you will need to run two full nodes, one legacy Bitcoin Core and two BIP148 enforcing the Bitcoin Core fork. We, we assume that you can have an understanding of the best practices outlined in the Glacier Protocol. To help protect your money, this guide will be frequently updated with the latest developments. Share this guide with your friends by directing them to the user-activated softworkguide.com. And I will have a link in the show notes to all the different um, guidelines and stuff like that here. So what is BIP148? We already know what it is. It begins um, August 1st. Hard, hard fork versus soft fork. Um, we kind of already went over that. Why BIP148? Uh, the guide is about to help you to protect your money by providing objective, action, actionable things that do as a result of BIP148 and not delve into the political, economic, or other reasons. Additionally, BIP148 will patch the mal transaction malleability that is currently active in the Bitcoin core software. If you want a quick background on the reasons, then this piece by the extremely respected open source Linux kernel developer Rusty Russell, who has been working on the Lightning Network, uh, should hit the spot. The optimi optimistic, um, those optimistic towards BIP 148, so those ambivalent towards BIP 148. It seems that most community members are ambivalent towards BIP 148. Trace Mayer and Jeff Bursick discuss BIP 148, and both are ambivalent towards it, towards it but think it feels important to be prepared for it. Uh, here's an interesting analysis by Jimmy Song of BIP-148 impacts various actors in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, we'll talk about Jimmy Song in a moment. An article by Nicholas Dora, why all users of businesses prepare for BIP-148 and get it in a great decision tree. So it goes to this course, what happens on August 1st, 2017. 
If minors activate SegWit prior to August 1st, 2017, then BIP 148 will not be enforced. All users of the Bitcoin will remain on the same chain no matter what client they use. So if SegWit 2x gets activated before August 21st, then BIP 148 is not going to occur. If miners don't activate SegWit, then there may be a chain split, and a chain split will mean that some users will see a different set of transactions than others. If the majority of miners enforce BIP 148, then these chain splits will temporarily and eventually all clients will see the same chain, and SegWit will activate for all SegWit compatible clients, which Bitcoin Core 13 version um, has. If the majority of miners don't enforce BIP 148, the users that enforce BIP 148 will diverge from users that do not enforce it. So if the majority of miners don't start enforcing BIP 148 at a later date, then the legacy chain without BIP 148 enforcement may, re may be recognized once the BIP 148 chain has more work. The users who are running BIP 148 would be undisturbed, but the users running legacy clients may see large amounts of history rewritten and can lose funds. So how do I prepare, prepare if BIP 148 if there's a split? The most important thing you can do is perform your own network consensus by running a full node and creating and storing your own private keys. That means you'll need to run a full node for the legacy chain like Bitcoin Core and a full node for the Bitcoin 148 chain, like a fork of Bitcoin Core with the Bitcoin 148 rules and forks. This will put you in firm control of the decision, decisions related to how to uh, interact instead of having some third party make the decision for you. Additionally, it's unknown how the legacy chain the Bit 148 chain will be labeled. This could lead to significant confusion in the marketplace, so it's important for you to know exactly what you're buying or selling. Possible scenarios from Bit 148. Bit 148 requires support from the economic majority, particularly exchanges and wallets. If this does not occur, no software supporting Bit 148 should not be running after August 1st, and it will cause a chain split leading to the abandonment of Bit 148. There are strong economic incentives in the Bitcoin system for nodes to cooperate and remain in consensus to prevent, prevent chain splits. If the economic majority is signaling as of August 1st, the miners have many incentives to follow along. Not following along would make it difficult to sell coins mined after August 1st, as the blocks would not be accepted by the economic majority. Essentially, miners would be producing an altcoin not recognized by users in exchange and making them less useful in a lower demand. Some miners will might could opt to ignore the Bit 148 rule and attempt to split the chain, but this would require a majority of miners who would be out of the consensus for the rest of the economic majority. The majority of the hash power follows Bit 148. All nodes will follow the chain regardless if they are running Bit 148, and non-compliant blocks will be orphaned. All SegWit nodes will eventually activate SegWit. If a minority of the hashing power under 51% follows Bit 148, nodes running Bit 148 will be fine, but those not running Bit 148 will be out of consensus with the rest of the economy. In this scenario, the more the economy that runs Bit 148, the better. Miners will find it, very, find it difficult to sell their coins, meaning economically motivated miners to start enforcing Bit 148. So in essence, you would end up being um, having two coins, the coins that are SegWit compatible and the coins that are not. Uh, wallets supporting Bit 148. A list of wallets here does not apply any endorsement of the quality or security of the software. Put on your big boy or girl pants and use it at your own risk. So Electrum, uh, Samurai Wallet, CoinKite, Coinami, Green Addresses, Ledger Wallet, Mycelium, Electrum, Airbits, and Bitcoin, and Trezor and Jax all have signaled for uh, supporting BIP 148 compatible wallets. As a holder, if a chain split occurs, then a long-term investor will have equal amount of coins on both sides of the chain. If the chain split is resolved, then they will have the original balance on the unified chain and need to take no action. As a Bitcoin trader, as a trader, you will need to find an exchange that supports preferably both the legacy chain and the BIP 148 chain. Traders may have opportunity to trade coins from one side to the other. If the exchanges support both coins, then they can sell one and buy on the other. If the sufficient, sufficient demand exists on Bit 148 chain, and they encourage miners to mine on that chain, which will eliminate any split. Traders should ex exercise caution when trading on the legacy chain, as it may be recognized without warning or reorganized without warning. Traders should also exercise caution on Bit 148 chain, as if the interest is insufficient and may not hold long term value. Uh, the following list of exchanges that have or will support Bit 148. So, uh, Bit Refill, Carlos, Ballas, Satoshi Counter, uh, Voltura, Mode. Mojo Bitcoin, Bitlicious, Bitfinex, Bitstamp, and Bitconic. Spinning Bitcoins. If you're spinning Bitcoins, then you should protect yourself from accidentally spinning on both chains. Since many transactions are valid on both chains, the same transaction could be replayed on the other chain, thus making it making you spin on the other side as well. Before you send a transaction, you should split your coins and be sure which chain you receive honors. You can either use a coin splitting service or you can split your own coins by creating and broadcasting your own transaction on both chains. Receiving Bitcoins. If you're receiving Bitcoins, then you need to pick up pick which side of the chain you, you honor. Warning, since the legacy chain could be reorganized, then you need to evaluate the risk when receiving coins on the legacy chain. The common security practice is to wait at least six confirmations before relaying on a transaction or block. 
If there's a chain split, the users can exercise extreme caution and closely monitor the split along with requiring more confirmation because the security of the chain to be regained. To be extremely safe, we recommend having at least 100 to 200 confirmations before relay, relay on the transaction or block. As a minor bit, you can easily cheaply be supported by users, businesses, exchange, and wallets. Uh, storing Bitcoins with third parties, we recommend you contact your third parties to determine whether they support the legacy chain of Bitcoin 48 or both. Be sure to get any commitments in writing so that if you need a lawyer, you'll, be, you'll have it for any litigation. For example, when something similar to happen with Ethereum, there was a significant confusion at Coinbase. If you store your coins with a third party, such as an exchange, then you should understand the policy for which the chain they support. Under the theory of unjust enrichment, significant legal issues could be raised if the third parties are occurring benefit to themselves that you should occur to the benefit of users. The safest plan for storing coins on August 1st, 2017 is gain control of your coins, operate your own full nodes, and evaluate your options after a potential coin split. What companies are saying about 148, and it lists all of them, a lot of different ones. As a third party, the safest route would be supporting both chains. Conclusion. If BIP 148 is successful, then there's little no action needed for each user. However, around August 1st, 2017, users should be cautious, especially when receiving coins. Most users will likely wait until more clear information is available. Summary. By opening a fair and unbiased market for directly trading non-segwited Bitcoin, Bitcoin tokens, the BIP 148 segwit Bitcoin tokens will, in advance before actual BIP 140 activation, market demand for segwit disabled coins on the, on the one hand, and for a SegWit enabled Bitcoin, on the other hand, can be determined in a fair and reliable way before SegWit activation on August 1st, 2017 happens. This solves the dilemma that nobody knows in advance of August 1st what the actual market user demand for SegWit is, because today miners' hashing rate is not representing real market demands. So Jimmy Song, uh, he's a uh, Bitcoiner, if you will. Uh, he's a Bitcoin developer and entrepreneur. Uh, he's been talking a lot lately, or has been for a while, but his uh, voice, you might say, is kind of crack through the, uh, the noise uh, about the Bitcoin so block size debate, in particular about user activated software, what so you know forks are, things of that nature. And he's been kind of like the, the go-to guy that everyone's been uh, speaking with um, through the various uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin-centric uh, podcasts, uh, news outlets, and, and media in general. So here's his opinion on the matter of Bitcoin and the user act activated software. So he publishes May 29th. So and it's through Medium. So Bitcoin, the user activated software, can skin in the game. Uh, that's the title of the blog, or post, if you will. If you've been following various Bitcoin personalities on Twitter, you'll notice that a lot of people have a USF in their Twitter name. If you don't know what it is, the supporters of the user activated software have an informative website, and if you're technical, you can read the uh, Bit 148. I will note here that Bit 149 is another uh, USF proposal, but, 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 but uh, Bit 148 is a bit more urgent as the important date set by the proposal on August 1st, 2017. In this article, I will seek to show what the UASF actually does and what each actor in this unfolding drama has to weigh going forward. In particular, I will attempt to make clear what support or opposition to Bit 148 looks like and what it would mean to each constituency in the Bitcoin network. I've written about this before, but this article is about what will be required for the UASF to work. What does Bit 148 actually do? Uh, here, Bit148 has a reference information code for exactly what it does. Uh, he has it here. If you don't read C++, the comments themselves are pretty instructive. All the conditions have to be met for Bit148 software to reject the block, otherwise valid. The block has to be found between the dates of August 1st, 20, 2017 and November 15th, 2017. August 1st, 2017 is the date chosen by Bit148 for block rejection, and November 15th, 2017 is when the current SegWit proposal expires. SegWit is not already on the network, and Block is not signaling SegWit. How will this affect the network? Practically speaking, there will come, will come a Block X, the first block after August 1st, uh, not signaling SegWit. That will be rejected by the BIP-148 nodes, but accepted by the non-BIP-148 nodes. For the sake of clarity, we'll call the Block before X C. BIP-148 nodes will be on C, and other nodes on X. At some point, miners running BIP-148 will produce a Block Y, building on Block C. He has a little diagram of the situation. But we, well, we have what's called a fork. So for the time being, this will be what's called a soft fork. Now, should there be no miners running BIP148, the scenario will look like this. C, the X, other software, and nothing on the BIP148 software. 
In this case, Bit148 nodes will simply stop at C and will be stuck with no transactions possible until the software is changed. As shown above, despite having user activated a name, the actual fork still is triggered by a miner. At least one miner needs to be running Bit148 software to fork. In fact, sort of a switch to proof of stake or something similar. There really isn't a way for any software to be triggered by anyone but a miner. This is an important point because despite all the rhetoric, Bit148 still needs miners to have any chance of success. And essentially, Bit148 is creating a new consensus rule for its chain, simply signaling for SegWit. That means that for a Bit148 fork, provided there's enough hashing power, SegWit will activate as 100% of the blocks will be signaling SegWit, which is above the 95% hash needed. What does this mean for me? If you're a user on the network, that means the transactions will be slower for two weeks at a minimum, longer the hashing power is lower, and more likely there will be some serious disruption as merchants and exchanges will likely suspend any Bitcoin transactions if there is some clarity on the forking situation. Further, even after the forking situation is resolved, there's a high likelihood of there being two Bitcoins in a very messy divorce. So why is it called user activated? Uh, there are two ways in which Bit148 is user activated. First, is that if enough users buy coins on the USF of the chain, they can make even a minority fork succeed by giving it more economic value than the other chain. Indeed, that is the power users have, to buy and sell the currency. The hope is that by giving the uh, USF chain more value, they can create incentives for miners to mine more on their chain and eventually overtake the other chain and win. At this point, without a permanent fork, the other chain would disappear in a really large uh, reorg. In this way, the pro proponent of Bit 148 will use a user to show everyone who's boss and bring the miners to heal. The other argument is that it's actually not non not users activated as much as economic node activated. Economic nodes are the nodes that matter, like the nodes that various exchanges, wallets, miners, etc. The hope is that if enough economic nodes can be convinced to run BIP 148 software, that more users will then utilize the chain, giving it more value, and creating better monetary incentives for miners eventually overtaking the other chain and link. Once again, the end game here will be making the other chain disappear. What does supporting Bit148 mean? Many users on Reddit seem to think that if enough users ran Bit148 software, they would make Bit148 more likely. Perhaps there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Uh, fresh running node software is very easy and cheap. In fact, it's so easy that you, act, you really shouldn't be trusting the node statistics as it's very easy to fake. No software is useful because the node owners can validate the transactions in the box themselves. Essentially, no software is useful because you don't have to trust others, but it doesn't do much for actual blockchain state unless you mine. As a node, you have the right to reject blocks or transactions for any reason, but that too is not useful unless others agree with you. This is why Bit148 proponents desire support from economic nodes such as miners, exchanges, wallets, and merchants. And let's take a look at each and see what their incentives would be. Users of Bit148. From the perspective of the user owning transactions, the coin is the main concern. Supporting Bit148 means being able to own and transact the coin that results from the fork. That doesn't preclude owning or transacting the other fork. In fact, most supporters of Bit148 will want to have a non-Bit148 node running so they can sell it. Exchanges in Bit148. From the perspective of exchange, the main thing we'll need to do is to allow deposits and withdrawals for people using their service. Supporting one Bit148 means that their users can buy and sell the Bit148 coin should it happen. No, nope, this is not preclude supporting the other chain. In fact, it's very much in the interest of the exchanges and even a USF F advocates for the exchange to support the other chain as many will want to trade one chain coin for the other. This unfortunately has a lot of consequences. Exchanges likely will not support a coin without some support of replay protection. That is, transactions on one chain should not be valid on the other. This cannot happen if Bitcoin currently stands without a permanent fork. Thus, getting exchange support likely means there's no chance of a Bitcoin merge back to one chain. That said, there may be a way around this by using futures. That is, not actually trading the coins themselves, but the potential split in the future. Bitfinex already does this with Bitcoin Unlimited Fork. This has its own perils, however, as there may not be enough liquidity and Bitcoins will have to be locked up with the exchange for the duration of the whole drama, much like Bitcoin, Bitcoin Unlimited Coins on Bitfinex, Bitfinex today. Because of this lockup custodial risk, futures are not something we can expect the vast majority of Bitcoin holders to utilize. As a result, we can expect much less liquidity in the future markets than in the normal market, and low liquidity means that the futures are very easily manipulated which likely means the futures won't be a reliable indicator until everything happens. For those in doubt, this ask betting markets would happen with Brett X or Trump. Wallets and Bit148 Wallets and Bit148 Wallets in the Bitcoin space are almost entirely open source. Support for Bit148 means, simply means that the wallet is compatible with the software. Should the wallet developers oppose Bit148, the fork 
will likely be made supporting Bit 148 and vice versa. In fact, a wallet that supports both forks is desirable since everyone will want to know the balance of the coins on both chains. Even the value of the coins on the forks are $10,100. You will still want to transact on the chain with $100 so you can do something with it, like trade for coins on the higher value fork. Merchants and Bit 148. Merchants and payment processors mainly want to get paid for their goods or services. Support being 148 simply means allowing people to pay for goods on the chain. that chain. This is not an unreasonable expectation and, once again, does not preclude utilizing the other chain. Again, this may be desirable even from a USFF advocate. Advocates seeing being able to spend coins from the other chain gives it liquidity. Of course, merchants will have the same expectation of exchange and that the coins that they receive won't simply disappear. Hence, they'll want some chain reward protection and replay protection before supporting both chains. Miners with Bit 148. For all the constituents that we examined thus far, supporting Bit 148 means that you can support both forks within the USFF happens. There's really, there are really only economic benefits, not really economicalities with forwarding a Bit 148 fork, other than some fixed costs, running a node, shaping some software, etc. These active actors in the Bitcoin ecosystem do not have to choose which software they run. They can run both, and really, they should if they want to maximize their value. Miners are the exception. When mining a block, they have to choose which fork to build on. In fact, they are the only ones in the entire ecosystem that are forced to choose. Everyone else can probably and will run both forks should a, U a UASF happen. Miners have to choose one or the other fork when they mine a block. Okay, I'm going to get back to that because that's a consistent thing, but let me finish. Skin in the game. Skin in the game means that there's a cost to supporting something. Everybody else as seen above essentially has only fixed costs, often fairly small to support Bit 148. Miners have a significant continuing cost to support Bit 148. Miners, because of the forced choices of having to signal one way or the other in the blocks that they mine, have significant skin in the game. This has some significant consequences. What would you expect the, mi the miners will be the last ones to show support for Bit 148 since they take the most risks? This seems to be the case as only one miner out of the top 17 seems to be supporting Bit 148, and that one, Bit Theory, seems to be backing the agreement from Consensus 20 2017. In other words, more than 94% of the mining hash power, probably a lot more, are not supporting Bit 148. You should suspect that miners on the side of the fork that has the chain reorganized risk to protect the skin they put in by forcing a hard fork should a, U, a, USF, a UASF happen. Instead, they seem to, to be the plan. We are preparing a UAHF to the market. We will we'll have two kinds of Bitcoin if a US, UASF is activated. Big block versus one megabot. Now let us trade. This is by Jin Wu, uh, one of the heads of one of the uh, biggest mining pools out there. He tweeted that April 4th of 2017. Really, the only way then to have skin in the game support Bit 148 is to mine Bit 148 blocks. Everyone else will simply be running both chains as it is their advantage. Mining equipment has dropped in price recently, and mining yourself is really the only way to contribute to the to a, a USF via, via Bit 148. All other Attempts are really attempts to solve the Byzantine general problem without proof of work. The, this should make intuitive sense. Bitcoin is a decentralized system where if a big chain were achieved with a little in the way of money, resources, or time, it would be exploited very quickly. There's a real cost to change of things, and that very well mean a loss of money. A $7 plus spent by lots of people, or $1,000 plus. In other words, Bitcoin is really hard to change, and that's a wonderful feature. Our culture is used to be able to sign some meaningless change.org petition and feel like we've done something to actually change things. Advertisers tell you all the time if you only buy their product, your problems will be solved. Our society that wants to believe there are easy answers to everything. We're used to wishful thinking and minimal effort and reject responsibility. Bitcoin doesn't care. Bitcoin doesn't care if you post arguments on Reddit. Bitcoin doesn't care if you put something clever in your Twitter name. Bitcoin doesn't care if you educate people, write articles, and make clever tw Twitter insults. Bitcoin doesn't care about your wishes, your feelings, or your arguments. With Bitcoin, you have to put real real skin in the game, real time, like years spent refining software to remove vulnerabilities, real money like millions of dollars to design, test, and manipulate uh, our design, test, and manufacture ASICs, real resources like developers, marketers, project managers, and venture capital, making real things like node software, wallets, mining equipment, payment processors, and exchange. Whatever side you're on in this debate, this, this is certain. If you want to change Bitcoin, you have to pay the price. So I don't I know that everyone says about the economic incentive for miners to mine the, the longest chain, whether it be the Bit 148 or the current consensus chain, but 
I don't think what it's accounted for is this concept of stubbornness and being an asshole. There's nothing preventing a miner from doing both. If they're a large enough mining pool, they might devote a small percentage of their, their hashing power to the BIP-148 and just to see who else would join them and still keep the other chain going and and switch over slowly and slowly and slowly until whether the BIP-148 one comes to existence or just turn off and go back to the other to the other chain. Um, I think it's possible for, for both of that to happen and I don't think a lot of people are taking that into uh, consideration. So there's uh, these two tweets that came out July 3rd. Uh, one by Charlie Shrim and one by Samurai Wallet. Uh, so Charlie Shrim was replying to Eric Voorhees and three others. Yes, there's very little support for Bit 148. Jack supports Segwit 2X as well, and most exchanges in wallets too. Samurai Wallet replied, Our support tickets have more than tripled in the last two months. The most popular query by far is, Will you support Bit 148? And then the reason why I, this is from our Bitcoin is that, um, and the, the title of the post is, BIP 148 momentum is gaining speed. Keep pushing your users, can't be ignored if they make their voices heard. Do your part by contacting your exchanges, wallet providers, and other businesses and ask for BIP 148 support. Uh, Luke Jr. made a comment, if Bitcoin doesn't work at all as is, meaning the BIP 148 chain, then the consensus for a POW or proof of work change can be safely assumed. Uh, we'll get in that discussion when we talk about the downsides of both segway activations, but this is something that's been threatening for. You have the miners threatening to do their own hard fork, and the core of people considering going through proof of stake instead of proof of work. So just throwing that out there. And there's a difference between proof of work and proof of stake, but I'm not really going to get into the difference right now because I think it kind of distracts from the overall. So I just want to add in a couple of notes and then kind of wrap this up here. You have one mining pool, and there's a few others, a list of people that are supporting, but one of the more outspoken is Bit Theory has Signal 4, user activated soft fork segment, and it's a pretty fairly big mine. Uh, you also have, you know, some more. Uh, Brave New Coin has an outline for what to do, uh, emergency plan if it, uh, to enact SegWit for Bitcoins, what to do as a user to protect yourself um, article, as well as a Bitcoin magazine article uh, about a beginner's, a beginner's guide to survive uh, Bit148 uh, user activated soft fork. So those are free, free your perusal, but they pretty much cover kind of the same things that we've already uh, spoken and talked about here. What I'm going to read is from one of the Bitcoin core developers and why he uh, supports uh, SegWit plus uh, UASF. So, and he is Eric uh, Lobronzo. And he published this on Medium and that was done May 29th. So here we go. Why is the part Bit 148? When I first started working on Bitcoin applications nearly six years ago, I worked on the assumption that even though the Bitcoin software itself Mind of all, the consensus rules that allow the system to converge to a single ledger state were essentially immutable. At the time, I didn't own a lot of Bitcoins, and I mostly thought of it as a cool new technology. But I did understand the value of the network that prevented malicious actors from being able to easily alter the ledger or its rule. In the early days, I thought the technology had great promise, but I was realistic in acknowledging that even though it was tremendously useful for storing significant amounts of money very cheaply, i.e. you can store over a million pretty securely, which is a relatively tiny transaction fee, and a couple of pieces of paper, Significant technology innovations would be required to allow the system to scale to compete with existing payment systems such as credit cards, PayPal, or cash. A little too over years, two years ago, the scaling issue was brought to the Bitcoin dev billing booth. Specifically, a 20 megabyte hard fork proposal that had been sold behind closed doors to industry had been leaked to the million. This was the first time since I started working on Bitcoin that I feared that the single property I most cherish about Bitcoin was at risk. The rules underlying how the ledger converges might be altered arbitrary just because a few people got together in a room and agreed on something in private. If you see people cringe at these sort of things, there's a good precedent for it. No matter how well intended, a significant chunk of Bitcoin users will oppose no matter what. Since then, I worked digitally to try to listen to the industry concerns and meet with stakeholders. I tried to listen to all the points of view and seek a solution that would best satisfy all interests with little disruption to the network and without sacrificing the most cherished property mission earlier and ensure that the discussion takes place in a full public view with participation from the entire community. 
I spoke to all the best protocol developers I knew and asked them what could be really done. We spent months discussing things in public chats and mailing lists. I also participated in three scaling Bitcoin conferences as a sponsored speaker. The result of all this was that we came to be known as Segregated Witness, or Segwit. A protocol upgrade that retained backward ca- ca- compatibility, doubles the block size for typical transactions, and fixed a host of issues that have been plaguing protocol development and key inventions required to allow Bitcoin to achieve mass scale. There was a concerted effort at a disinformation campaign along with social attacks on social media sites such as Reddit, which sought to disrupt development. Many different interests seem to be battled in an app, but one thing that cannot escape notice is that the only activity the Bitcoin protocol anticipatory rewarding is mining, and the advent of professional mining pools coupled with A6 meant that all direct acquisition and rewards for running the protocol was going to these people, not developers, not merchants, and not regular users. Some of us tried to meet directly with top mining pool operators and ASIC manufacturers and attempt to find a way to continue work together to keep advancing the protocol. It was always my deep conviction that while there is nothing interestingly wrong with having private meetings, decisions affecting the consensus rule of the Bitcoin protocol must always be made via public process with opportunity for anyone with concerns to weigh in. I strongly oppose private agreements on consensus rules, and perhaps the process needs a little revamping, but it must be kept public and include rigorous peer reviewing. I believe it is everyone's fundamental right to run whatever code they want on their computers, whether it's Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin or BTCD or some custom branch of, the, of these or something entirely different. If the economic incentives of the network can't keep us all in consensus without requiring corrosive means, something seems to be fundamentally broken about Bitcoin. These economic incentives are the ties that bind us even with facing the attackers, not signing agreements made by self-styled elitists behind closed doors. Last summer, top Bitcoin protocol developers and mining pool operators had a meeting in Palo Alto. It was meant to be an icebreaker, a way of different people to get to know one another and hear each other's concerns. But the ultimate decisions on consensus rules change will still be left up to the community at large after public discussion and by ensuring users retain the ability to run the software they're choosing and no agreement placing any restriction on such was to be signed. In this meeting, it was agreed that, that more hard fork research was desired and such research was made and some of it published at the Bitcoin hard fork research GitHub. Mining pool operators, in particular, uh, Jean Wu and Mercy Song, agreed that there was single segment using BIP9 upon the release of the production ready code, which occurred later in the fall, after the third scaling Bitcoin conference. However, soon after this meeting, Bit- Bitmain ceased responding to, it, to all my attempts at communication and instead began supporting a fork of the Bitcoin fork code base that directly breaks with the consensus rules. Not being someone to give up so easily, I continued to attempt to reestablish communication. And finally, months later, though, the help of someone who had contacted with Bitmain and was able to get in touch with a young Wu and agreed for a meeting with all the top mining pools, which took place in Beijing in March. In my opening remarks, I explicitly stated that I was not there to try to force any decisions on them, that it was entirely in their right to run whatever software they wanted, whether Bitcoin 4 or something else. I was there to listen to their concerns and see if we might be able to find some common ground. I also made clear that nothing was to be signed and any proposal would have to go through public scrutiny and review before any commitments could be made by anyone. At first, I was very optimistic that we had made good progress and agreed with a few of the miners present. I did forge good bonds and made some great friend, new friends. But most immediately upon leaving, Zhang Wu reverted to his taunting tweets and bully taxes. It was as nothing had gotten through to him. He was only interested in playing his game, and this was hardly the first time he completely even made on a handshake. At this point, I had zero trust left for Zhang Wu and Bailey. I do not believe they have the best interest of the Bitcoin community in mind. They continue to collect substantial fees from everyone, yet try to deploy blame on others who get none of these fees whatsoever. They continue to block progress on the Bitcoin on the protocol development, fail to follow through, and keep on upping the demands, never satisfied with anything we deliver. They never come through on anything they promised me, and perhaps others have had a different experience, just relating what I've witnessed myself. Therefore, I believe that time has come to make a more aggressive stance against this sort of behavior. Nothing short might seem to rattle Jung Wu very much, and the Bitcoin make markets are far mightier than Bitmain or Jung. This is a means in the hands of the users to demand their freedom for Bitmain's oppression and to push them punish them if they do not comply. Therefore, I'm done with attempts at negotiating with Bitmain. Perhaps some will still want to give it a shot. I can't stop them from trying, but I am only predict, predict major disappointment. I try my best, and I do not believe there are any positive results to be gained at this point from the diplomatic approach. Therefore, I encourage everyone to support Bit 148 as a way to get past those impasse as quickly as possible. I'm happy to talk to anyone in the Bitcoin industry with sincere concerns about the risk involved in Bit 148 or any other issues and help them assess it opinions and see what I might be able to do to, do to help. I also think that very so it means well and love to help them find a way forward. Unfortunately, I do not see progress coming from the, uh, the new work uh, agreement and will continue to seek new approaches. I still look forward to collaborating with Barry Silbert and the uh, DCG, uh, the Digital Currency Group, and I'm willing to work with anyone sincere in their quest for solutions to problems Bitcoin is facing. And there you have it. The decision date is going to occur between 
July 23rd and August 1st. We're going to see whether Segwit 2X or BIP-148 is, uh, is, has occurred that would activate BIP-141 through BIP-148. And the New York Segwit, which is supposed to activate their version of Segwit through the miners, um, occurs. And then eventually three months after that, so August, September, October. So October slash November, we're supposed to see a two megabyte increase. We'll see if this is going to happen or if nothing's going to occur. But presently, at least as we stand, we're still at consensus. Everything's still at the status quo. And it's just really pretty much a countdown, if you will. So that- Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time.